Then officially, good morning. Thank you again for being here to be together. And uh, as I was saying, I'm not in my best possible self because I got the further, you not know, the booster, so to speak. I'm glad I got it, but you know, I have some, uh, you know, some ache somewhere. But I, I will be. I think I can do the work, as people say, or the job. And um, today I'm trying to combine what we did about the trauma and traumatic levels with what I view. And I don't have the book with me, so I need to get, you know, here it is. I have just, uh, this is the book I'm trying to, the big event, the big achievement today is putting together in two hours uh, what I have uh, put together in the book. And um, as I was saying, the book, uh, Borderline Bodies, Affect Regulation Therapy for Personality Disorders, is uh, what uh, I published with Norton. Uh, they asked me to put together a psychodynamic, psychoanalytic uh, uh, method um, for the intervention and the cure, the diagnosis and the cure of personality disorder. And, um, you know, they have, this is the section, it's, it's within this, the professional books series. Uh, the one directed by Alan Shore in the past and now by Luis Cozzolino, so new, new, neuroscientist mostly. But in this series, there are no people except Alan Shore in part who are psychoanalysts or psychodynamically trained. So I think uh, it's a, a big event in a sense. It's a big enterprise. And we, I, I think we, in terms of uh, psychodynamically trained people, we need to say our words and intervene and use our knowledge. It is a very specific, it's, it has been, you know, it has built up in centuries. It's at this point almost. You know, it's a huge understanding and knowledge of the mind that only psychodynamic people from Freud onwards have in mind and have developed and have devised. And, uh, if you read all major books on personality disorder or major books on uh, a lot of treatments, you know, the prevailing view, the prevailing point of view is cognitivism. I have nothing against cognitivism. It is just one side. It's one part. Or if you want to think of the, all the sides of the, the layers of the mind, it refers mostly to the top down the higher order kind of thing does not take into consideration what we now call as the unconscious which as i explained i hope decently enough to you it's the implicit memory it's the limbic system it's the emotions uh, that we have even ins inscribed in the body in what we call implicit memory, that is amygdala rooted in a sense. The, the roots are in the amygdala, which processes uh, all the memories and memories embodied, memories that are in the body that are not, we are not even conscious of. And so when we deal with personality disorders, only Kernberg's method, TFP, so, uh, transference focus psychotherapy uh, has devised a method in which uh, psychoanalysis and psychodynamic principles are taken into consideration. So the depth of psychoanalysis is not wasted in a sense. The other method of uh, uh, the manualized method for uh, treating, curing and healing personality disorders Besides TFP, Transference Focus Psychotherapy, Otto Kernberg, with whom I trained in 2005-2006, the other methods are mentalization-based treatment, Fonagy. I don't have any more. I used to have uh, um, the, the little diploma that you get at the end of the training. That It's mentalization-based treatment with Fonagy and uh, Bateman, who teach uh, two base uh, seminar, two workshops, mm, mm, fundamental stuff. It's uh, two or three days. I don't remember even if it is two or three days each time 
For them, that is the bulk of what you need to get to know mentalization-based treatment a bit more. What they deal with in terms of borderline uh, structures and uh, treatment, they everything, I mean, everything is uh, uh, grounded on uh, uh, mentalization, the concept of mentalization, which as you know, is not necessarily a psychodynamic, unconscious, psychoanalytically uh, um, based kind of principle. It is most at this point a cognitive understanding of how the mind works if you are based on mentalization. And the affect underneath mentalization are not so deeply explained. They speak about trauma. They have a developmental explanation of how you arrive at mentalization, at uh, sorry, lack of mentalization, which is the root of the borderline problem. But the, the techniques and the understanding and really how they work is not uh, psychodynamic or psychoanalytic at all. I know this from experience, as I told you, because, for example, in the training, they put us, um, you know, performing the role of um, role playing, performing the role of the therapist and the patient. If you went to the past of the patient, like, you know, something referring to the past of the patient, the first years, they would say, no, 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 you can't go to the past. Now, how can any psychodynamically uh, de device treatment, if that is the case, uh, not go back to some developmental story for the for the patient and for the, so if you delete the past i don't see how we can um, uh, first of all i don't see how they can treat people it is not only for them it's like a gym it's really like a gym you you exercise mentalization long enough until you be, you have you grow the muscles so to speak for mentalization. So when they, when they, when we had to rehearse, you know, you need to ask, what do you think that that person felt when you said the thing? How did you feel when that person said that uh, to you, et cetera, et cetera. It's like developing this process of mentalization, which means, let me repeat it again, to infer, to understand, to have a sense and an intuition or an insight of the motivations, the desire, the wish, the intentions underneath the behavior of the people, of the other people in front of you. And um, that means also if a person can do that, if you can infer, you know, understand, predict, blah, 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 what I said, evidently you can do that because you have been able to do it for yourself, which means you have arrived at the level of mentalization, which, let me repeat again, comes as a further development, like a third stage. I'm talking about mentalization. So I'm not in my field, but I am in, um, in uh, Fonagy and Bateman mentalization-based treatment kind of um, treatment uh, device. I was saying mentalization is the further up point, the last development after a basis that needs to come from affective development. Um, you might remember that you need to have um, several steps in which at first the child, for example, is afraid that it's like uh, taking for truth what is unreal. So it's like a, for, for the adult will be a psychotic view in which uh, if uh, the child uh, two or three years uh, sees an alligator underneath, uh, a plastic alligator underneath the bed, they would start crying maybe because they take for true what is not in reality. That is like the psychotic level. Then you have a moment that, is, that goes further into the evolution, into the development, because you have a child who may be, and this is an example, I think that Fonagy gives, you, the child takes like a chair and uh, uh, turns it down so that it can be carried out so that it looks like a cart. So he's playing in a way that already implies that he can do the as if phase. 
he can do things as as if as though they were something else. So it's a movement towards symbolic understanding. And after that, when the child, a healthy child, is five or six or whatever, when the child achieves that, if the child is healthy, that should be the the, the moment. But if if the child does not achieve the level of mentalization, then you have a problem. And borderline people have exactly this problem. So if you don't reach mentalization, you can you can't do what uh, what we said is mentalization. The problem is it does not come automatically. It comes from experience. It comes from having had somebody next to you even playing with you or talking to you, touching you, looking at you, taking care of you. All those uh, developmental levels of uh, care, those levels of interaction between self and other are the presupposition, the first, the, the, the mandatory element in a sense, for the mind to develop in the healthiest way. If the self other um, intervention is not, uh, the relationship is not in good shape. The child cannot develop empathy, mentalization, and all the further symbolic, uh, social, not only symbolic, I forget sometimes to say, the social levels of interaction. So you end up having people who are, for example, antisocial, which is a big problem for society. So when all is said and done, if we took care of the children and the families earlier on and in advance, instead of uh, letting the problems develop, we would have uh, safer, healthier, and less violent societies. This is the first statement. This is something that we as nations, as populations, as collectivities, not only as therapists, would need, need, need to know. We, we should, this should be what we learn in school, what we learn even not in psychology classes, this should be the general understanding that without a care between self and other, there is no future, I want to say. And self and other starts very early on. Self and other means the care and the cure and the, may I say, love, taking care of somebody for their own interest and their own growth. Love means that I put the good of the other person be before my own. This is um, it's not a, an evangelic uh, um, religious principle. This is what, if you read the Panksepp, the book on the archaeology of the mind, he very clearly states that. And other neuroscientists or other people interested in those uh, questions of evolution, development, etc., they say, why should a parent or somebody acting as a parent might not even be a biological parent because it does not come only from, or actually it does not come biology. I mean, vasopressin and oxytocin, all the hormones that are activated in the relational, caring, loving process of taking care of another, having a bond with another, those hormones are not activated by biology, meaning I am a mother, mother, I have va va vasopressin and uh, um, oxytocin. And it does not work that way. But the bond of love, Fonagy would say, and I, I like this, even I, I think I, I've said this already, I like to say this. Um, the bond of love, even with a pet, even with your dog, creates vasopressin and especially oxytocin which means the, the um, oxytocin is the hormones that facilitates all the processes of taking care and even sacrifice some of your needs, your desires for the good of the other. And I was saying, Iak Pansep, uh, in his book, at least two times, uh, wrote down and, uh, and you know, wanted to notice, wanted the reader to notice that uh, it, the sacrifice of the parents who take care of the children could be biological or non-biological, just the taking care of another who is depending on you, it's a huge sacrifice and comes evolutionary as something that we sort of, you know, in the, in the group of, uh, of humans, we take it almost for uh, granted. But, uh, you know, he stresses 
For what reason should anybody <laughs> devote himself or herself to the care of another endlessly like a mother with a child for, you know, at least six years <laughs> when the child goes to, to elementary school? But, you know, even, as you know, if you are parents, much uh, longer than that, or, you know, each of us knows that, that uh, if you have a child or if you take care of another being depending on you because they are evolving and they are growing, you need to, you know, you need to take care of this person for, uh, you know, day, night, uh, and with constancy and with sensitivity and uh, care. But when I say constancy, you know, meaning the same pace. It, it is not that you are mirroring the child and you are feeding the child, you're taking care of the child today, and then tomorrow you can do another thing and then you go back the next day. Uh, when we say that parental care needs to be constant and needs to be sensitive, it means also this repetition of the care that the person, growing person needs to receive. And that is constant for years. Now, the healing process of a borderline person is not like growing. It's not like growing up a child, you know, helping a child grow up again. But uh, it has similar features, meaning what has gone wrong in terms of attachment. And we can say right away that people who have borderline disorders and even narcissistic disorders, we come back, we put them in the same range of borderline organization. We will explain that a bit more. Uh, so people with borderline and narcissistic disorders are people who have disorganized attachment or at least insecure attachment. What does it mean? It means that they could not have constant parenting that was sensitive enough and uh, healthy and appropriate enough, which means it's not the fault of the parents if they could not attend to the child, but those parents would have had, would have had the need to be helped with those children because evidently the parents themselves were either traumatized themselves or borderline themselves or mentally with some psychological or mental problem or were using alcohol, drugs, et cetera, et cetera, so that they could not fulfill the duties in a sense of taking care of another being. And so it's not to blame the parents, but this is to say the problem starts very early on with people who have developed a borderline condition. Borderline in the sense of Kermber means, and you know, these things will be in the slides, you know, that I, I don't like to go back and forth with the slides a lot. But borderline for Kernberg, for Otto Kernberg, alive, he's actually giving lectures. Even now he's giving, a start. he started in November and he's, he goes on until March, I think. Every Tuesday he, he's giving 10 uh, lectures. It's, it's an Italian platform, but, uh, you know, there is a translation. You can uh, access that if you want. It's uh, um, psicologia dot psychology in Italian, psicologia.io. And I can give you the, the information about that if you want at the end. Um, as I was saying, um, for, uh, for Kernberg, borderline organization is something, it's a, a diagnosis that is a bit different from DSM because DSM views borderline only in the sense of those people who have ups and downs in, in emotionally, who cut and are self-cut and are suicide, suicidal or have a problem with impulsivity in at least two of us. Uh, but mostly, mo most of the times in a lot of behaviors like spending too much and using, <coughs> uh, being impulsive with uh, not only money, but, uh, you know, eating or um, other features like drinking and um, or drugs and other, like compulsion, compulsiveness uh, in uh, 
to fill a void, I have to say immediately. DSM does not say that, of course. And uh, so ups and downs in, in the emotions and, um, you know, being an emotional roller coaster is typical of these borderline people. Not in the sense of bipolar disorder, let me clarify. Bipolar is being depressed for a long time and then having a peak, usually, of a manic uh, ex- behavior in which you can become possibly even manic in your excessive spending money or in not sleeping at night or uh, engaging in uh, sexual practices in a sort of uh, uh, excessive way, you know, in those moments. And then for the rest, you are depressed. But this means long time. Borderline proper, as in DSM, I, I, I say proper, as Kernberg would say, because for us, trained with Kernberg, borderline is a much higher, longer, more complex organization, and we will define that in a second. Uh, so uh, for DSM, borderline is only you know, self-cutting, suicidality, compulsiveness in those areas, spending, et cetera, et cetera, ups and downs in emotionally. Uh, a problem with this image of the self so that one day they feel they are okay, the next moment, not the next day, the next moment they receive a negative phone call from this or that and they feel totally rejected, totally abandoned. The fear of abandonment and the behavior that they engage in because they feel easily rejected, abandoned, etc., etc., is is a major feature to recognize a borderline. That is in a sense, uh, the major uh, problem for them, the feeling of rejection, and I would say the feeling of emptiness, void. This is in DSM, and of course, uh, I don't have all the nine features straight there, but almost, and you need to have five features out of nine. I'm sure you know these things. You can check on DSM even now as I'm speaking. You need to have five out of nine of these features if in order to have a borderline proper in the DSM sense kind of uh, diagnosis. For Kernberg, Otto Kernberg, TFP is the method, transference focus psychotherapy. He thinks, and I agree, I mean, I'm not uh, repeating things that I don't like. I have, uh, as uh, actually, as uh, I think I've said already, we don't agree on a major fundamental thing that is the etiopathogenesis. He does not believe in trauma, if I can say that. He does not believe in attachment. So you can imagine how different we have become, not that I am anything compared to him, but you know, having been trained at his method, the etiopathogenesis is for me totally different. So even the implications for treatment at some point become different. But in any case, I would say borderline organization for Otto Kernberg means one, identity diffusion, meaning I don't know who I am because according to the moment when you ask me, if I am in a moment of euphoria, I am very happy. I have just received a wonderful love phone call. And I think this is the right man for me. I'm not joking. This is the way they behave. And I use this reference, this example, because 80% of borderline patients are women. 80% of narcissistic people are men. We need to have a question in our mind. But... We, we can't respond immediately to all the questions, but let's think why most uh, borderline people are, uh, the majority are uh, women and most narcissistic, well, there are a lot of narcissistic women, of course, but the bulk of uh, narcissistic disorders has to do mostly with men. So identity diffusion for Kernberg means if you ask them, Uh, give me a definition of yourself, what you like, what are the things that you prefer to do in your job, in your work, in your uh, relationship, how would you define yourself? According to the mood that they happen to be in that moment, they could be very happy or very angry, depressed, uh, furious about something. So the view of themselves, the image of themselves depends heavily on how they feel right there and uh, and their mood can change 
the switch can be really incredible. Even physically, they change. They, they look in their eyes, become totally different. Um, so identity diffusion is the first uh, feature. We could say other things about that, but I, in a sense, I also leave certain things to your understanding and your study. The second feature is uh, for Kernberg's uh, borderline organization is uh, primary defenses. What does it mean? In psychoanalysis, you know, as you know pretty well, while the other people in cognitivism and other things do not. So this is our specific realm and we need to be aware of that. In the psychoanalysis, we have uh, secondary uh, defenses, which are, we are not concerned with too much with borderline because secondary defenses are for everybody and uh, for uh, you know, even neurotic people, but they are not the major way, the major dynamic, they don't define the major dynamics for uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for borderline people. What are these defenses? I don't remember if we mentioned them already. If uh, we did, we will repeat them because it's necessary. The first one is denial. Denial. They don't see reality. Psychotic people have this problem too. You will see that the difference between what we call with Kernberg borderline, <coughs> the borderline continuum, and, uh, uh, and psychotic people is precisely that the first feature, identity diffusion, the second feature, uh, primary defenses are the same, even in psychosis. The difference is in the third principle for the diagnosis, which is reality testing. So I was saying, what are, which are, the, what are the, the primary defenses? We said denial, I'm sorry to open um, a little question. You know, in the world, we have been facing, we are still facing a pandemic. There has been, there has been, there have been tons of people who have been in denial, including some political leaders who have led their societies in a certain way. I'm sorry, I need to say this. So denial, um, uh, denial means that there are levels in the mind for some reason, and I, in my mind, it's, a, it's a, a traumatic route. Denial impedes these people to take uh, notice of reality. Could be anything, could be a mother who has an homosexual child, an homosexual son. Everybody knows. And, and so just to say examples of things that are very different, but to say one person, you know, everybody knows that maybe the son has been living for 20 years with his own partner. The mother, if you say, well, I think your son with this partner, they are almost they go, oh, no, it's impossible. Don't even think of that. Or I've seen that with mothers or people who are in heavy drugs and maybe have died of drugs. And they would uh, never, these mothers, they would never accept the idea that those poor, I'm sorry to say, I'm not being diminishing, those suffering people have died maybe of those drugs and the mothers are in denial, meaning they can't face the reality of what was the cause of their death. So denial is a huge problem and it comes, it's not since we don't have, I don't have a view of innatism so that you are born with denial. We need to ask ourselves why there are more and more layers of society that prefer denial to reality. I know it's a huge thing that I'm saying, but so denial is the first uh, primary defense. The second one, also extremely important for uh, borderline disorders in general, in the sense of the organization that uh, Otto Kernberg describes, is dissociation and splitting. I put them together. Are they different? The theories are different. Dissociation, as you know, and as I already argued with you, is something 
uh, Freud did not care for. I, I think I told you that I, I wrote, I published recently this article for um, uh, the, Ameri the Journal of American Psychoanalytic Association on pathologies rooted on dissociation versus pathologies rooted on repression, which means um, for Freud and for uh, traditional psychoanalysis, the major reasons, the major defense, the major cause for psychopathology was found in repression. For us nowadays, we know that uh, repression is a secondary defense. So it's mostly for neurotics and sort of healthy people. I, I think all of us, when we function okay, we are between the healthy um, neurotic range. So when I say neurotic, I say, I say somebody who has uh, difficulties, but not that severe. So we are not talking about them today if we are talking about borderline. Borderline is more severe. How so? More destructiveness in life, in, uh, in their resources, mental, physical, destructiveness in their um, careers, in the, in the way they use their even um, you know, um, intellectual resources. And they destroy their life, basically. So they are not neurotic. If you have a concern how to distinguish them, the level of um, the quality of object relation and the level of destructiveness. Borderline destroyed their lives, even sometimes physically, and they are not depressed. So I was saying dissociation is another primary defense. Dissociation, uh, we said, I spent the first two set of lectures describing why we think at this point with Shore, with Liotti, with my work, with other people, dissociation is really one of the major results or effects of traumatization, of interpersonal traumatization. And I stress interpersonal because interpersonal means trauma of human agency or trauma of human hand. We distinguished early on in our uh, meetings that uh, a natural catastrophe, uh, a, a typhoon, a tsunami, as devastating as they are, they do not create dissociation in the human mind. If they create a dissociation, if, uh, if, uh, if after a tsunami, after an earthquake, uh, in the mind of the subject, there is dissociation. It is because of a cumulative effect that has not started with that earthquake. It has started in, in, in interpersonal, intergenerational kind of reason, meaning early on, first two years of life, a dissociative structure, Liotti says, is the sign of trauma between mother and child, or first caregiver and child, usually a mother, first years of life, difficult upbringing, difficult childhood. So dissociation, I was saying, <clears throat> is one of the effects of uh, trauma, interpersonal trauma. The other one, let me repeat it, being hyper arousal, meaning the child cannot be calmed down, hyper arousal. So all the systems, are overwhelmed by stress and glucocorticoids and uh, cortisol and anxiety and other levels are very high. So dissociation and splitting, we said, are also primary defenses, typical of borderline disorders. Why splitting then? And how is it different from dissociation? I asked Kernberg, and I had my ideas, of course, but for him, splitting is more primitive than dissociation. I don't agree. He, he comes, he has this idea because based on Melanie Klein's theory. So for him, splitting derives directly from Melanie Klein. And uh, it, it is the basic stuff in a sense, the basic dynamic of what Melanie Klein calls 
uh, schizoparanoid phase. So in a sense, we are not saying things very differently when we speak of splitting in this primitive way, primary way of the schizoparanoid phase in, uh, in, um, in um, Melanie Klein's theory and, as, and dissociation. The point is that uh, dissociation in Freud almost did not exist, even if he had, and I've written a lot of things on this, so I, I could um, give you some bibliography about that, like uh, a book that came out uh, with Karnak in 2017 with Craparo, a colleague of mine in Italy, um, implicit unrepressed unconscious implicit memory and clinical work. We discussed this thing a lot. I discussed in particular the fact that for Freud, there was indeed, there would have been the possibility of having a view of dissociation linked to trauma. But you know that early on, and this is another important question of psychoanalysis, the theory of trauma that he um, considered, at, you know, he switched from a real seduction, end of 19th century, hysterical women. He said, sorry, I, I was wrong. I, I believed in what the hysterical women told me as if they had real stories. While I now understand that the problems of hysterics is in the fantasies, in the sexual fantasies, in the conflicts. So he turned his trauma theory into a conflict theory. This is the bulk of the problem. So that for Freud, dissociation never came up. Was it possible to speak of dissociation at his time? Yes. There was Pierre Janet, French. There was Ferenczi, Chandor Ferenczi, Hungary, Hungarian. So it was possible. And even as you read Freud, there are so many references to, uh, even early on, to um, um, how do you say, splitting of personality, and um, it does not say very often dissociation, it does not use the ter term, but it, it, it looks like it's speaking about that. But uh, dissociation is something that came out afterwards, mostly, and this is interesting and to think of, uh, in cognitivism, in uh, those trauma theoreticians like uh, van der Kolk, like uh, Nin Genius, I never know how to pronounce that, other theoreticians in Europe, contemporary people, who even cut his steel or other people who uh, speak of dissociation without this, the psychoanalytic root in a sense, without the story of psychoanalysis. And for us, we know that Freud could have gone in a certain direction and he didn't. But this is to say, Freud went in the direction of repression. We now understand um, uh, dissociation as uh, one of the major uh, results, effects, and evidence that there has been um, trauma between mother and child or even intergenerational trauma, meaning, as we said in our previous lectures, that the mother has been traumatized. And as Shore says, if the mother has been traumatized, there will be moment in which the mother, the mind of the mother goes blank for the child. The child has no connection to the mind of the mother early on. I mean, a, a small child, first year, two years of life. In those moments, the child has, is facing a blank, uh, a bit like the still phase, uh, facing the, an interruption of communication. The, the state of mind of the mother is not there with the child. The mother is dissociating, dissociating. And so there can be moments of dissociation that goes from the right brain, sure would say, of the mother into the child. So this is another important feature. For I'm, I'm still talking about um, the, the primary defenses that are typical of the functioning of borderline organization according to, to, um, to Campbell. The other one would be idealization, the other, fit, the other defense is idealization versus um, devaluation. Typical of hysteric histrionic, typical of narcissist. 
do we use our, I mean, ourselves, normal people, some levels of idealization and evaluation? Of course, but not to the extreme that are used in personality disorders when you have hysteric histrionic who need to idealize an object out of them, and or uh, narcissist who whose fragile self-esteem is rooted on idealization versus uh, devaluation in connection with another primary defense, which is grandiosity and omnipotent control. The other fundamental primary uh, defense that these people are using, and you can see that immediately as soon as they come in front of you, is projective identification. I think we spoke about that. Projective identification means they have an unregulated mass of emotions, mostly of amygdala kind, meaning rage, anger, uh, fear, negative feelings, very low self-esteem in certain moments, dangerous uh, uh, moments for their own esteem so that they could um, become... Uh, uh, suicide, suicidal or uh, they could self-injure in those moments, those people are still working on projective identification. Projective identification means they have a mass of emotions in, in themselves that they uh, communicate, make the other person feel always in their uh, exchanges with the other. So that as a colleague of mine in Spain, a Spain uh, psychiatrist would say, you know immediately when you have a borderline in front of you, because after 10 minutes, you are filled with rage and anger. You want to kick them. <laughs> you want to, to beat them up. So that is projective identification. Projective identification, going back to the development, is what each of us has had in the first years of life. We all needed to have regulation and care from another person in order to go from projective identification. I'm uh, angry, I'm afraid, I'm fearful, I'm uh, cold, I'm hungry, I'm this and that. A bulk of basic, not even emotions, but affect. Affect is more rooted in the body. This is also in Freud. Emotions is a further level. So those strong affects, if they are regulated by somebody, does not need to be a biological parent. If somebody has regulated those affects for us, it means that we go beyond projective identification. So we can arrive at the mentalization. We can say, okay, this person next to me is behaving not in a very nice way, but do I need to kick him to hit him right away? Or can I maybe say a few things and then maybe we can organize something different? So it's, uh, it's a way of becoming in, in time. I mean, evolutionary, we become, we reach the control of impulses. We don't work only from the amygdala point of view. We work, if we have a right at that level, from the frontal areas, orbitofrontal areas, which means some restraint, socially appropriate, uh, some control, impulse control, symbolization, symbolization, etc., etc., etc. So, projective identification, if it remains in somebody who is over 18 years old, you know that the diagnosis for personality disorder is made in psychiatry only after 18 years old. Why? Because the personality is more stable. So, if somebody uh, has a projective identification, or let me say it that way, if somebody has a diagnosis of borderline, even according to DSM, for us it means he has denial, dissociation, idealization versus devaluation, and especially projective identification, meaning a mass of emotions that have not been organized by anybody. I don't want to say by the mind of the mother, because it seems that we are uh, offending the mothers. It means there has been nobody who could do that huge job for them. It also means that those mothers or parents could not have another mother or parent who, who has done that for them. It's always an intergenerational uh, kind of process. Okay, 
So this was the second level that I'm, um, the second item in a sense, the second feature, this primary defense, uh, defenses element that we are talking about is the second element for us with um, Kernberg to, um, uh, to, when I open the window, I'm always curious how my mind goes. I want to greet you, I want to, but I can't. But I, I, that is the way my mind goes. And uh, I was saying, so this is the second element of, uh, uh, for the diagnosis of a borderline organization, according to Kember. As I said already, the third element for the diagnosis is retained reality testing. When I say this, my students say, why retained? <laughs> reality testing, let's say. Retained means that compared to the psychotic people, they retain reality testing. Because otherwise, if they did not have reality testing, they would be psychotic. Which means these people are very severe, which means they live very painful, disruptive lives. They can kill themselves, they can kill other people out of impulsivity, out of rage, out of uh, desperation. It's not because they are called criminals or serial killers, but they can become very violent because they are very frustrated. If they are borderline in the sense of DSM, impulsivity, disruption of moods, et cetera, et cetera, their amygdala, this is the major thing for borderline per se, the amygdala is always inflated, is always red in uh, magnetic resonance is always or yellow, whatever, it's always active, hyperactive, and there is not enough control from orbitofrontal areas, okay? That is the major uh, neurobiological description of how their mind works. In terms of relations, they work through all those defenses, so we spoke about that. I think we can go beyond. I gave you a lot of slides, but of course we're not going to deal with them. You can read them and do. Um, this is what I came up with after reading tons of pages. <laughs> if you read Alan Shore, only the first, just simply the first book, he published in 1994 is something like 1800 pages, very thin, very, very small um, characters. And um, that book in Italian does not exist. I doubt, uh, I, I doubt Alan Shore is translated into Russian. So I suppose, unless you read English, I suppose you don't uh, read Alan Shore. So Having read not only the first book, of course, but all the subsequent books and articles that he published, to write the first book, Alan Shore, in this moment, uh, alive in Los Angeles and productive in his uh, early 70s, uh, part of um, LA uh, University, um, uh, California uh, University at LA, and um, David Gesson, professor, whatever. Um, to write that book, he says, he closed himself in the house for 10 years. And I believe that because I've seen how he works, even in his apartment. He has uh, piles of articles up to the wall. He has piles of articles. And he has wardrobes of notes that he has taken, he has shown those to me, he has taken the notes that he has taken, it's, uh, it's no, um, fill cupboards, the notes that he has taken from those articles. So this is to say the kind of deep, intense, uh, uh, wide-ranging interdisciplinary work he engaged with for so many years and decades. So in any case, I try to summarize, and he has approved of this map, so my synthesis in his mind was okay. I tried to summarize. Shor speaks about early relational trauma. We said already that first level of trauma for me. He does not speak about what we, with me, what I, what I call second level of trauma, in which I differentiate between traumatization when a mother is incapable of uh, dealing with the child but is not beating the child. 
and therefore does not inscribe in the child the victim persecutor diet. That is another thing we will repeat. But for, for, for sure, there is only one level of traumatization. Early relational trauma is everything. For him, I tried to put together the moments evolutionary or developmentally, I should say, in which the child evidently has had a major crisis if the child has become without further reparation, if the child has become a borderline, also in the sense of Kernberg, a borderline in general. If you have the most severe and the, the worst pathology you can have in this field, they are not psychotic, but they are verging on that because they, they have no empathy, they are verging on lack of reality testing, etc., etc., are antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder is in DSM. Is it treatable? Question. According to Campbell, it is not. If you really have an antisocial, it means no motivation to be cured, no capacity for relations, no desires to, to connect to the human level of relationship, and everything rooted about uh, cold violence, basically, so aggressiveness. For sure, it means developmentally that there were early traumata even in utero. But, you know, either in the three months of gestation of a pregnancy or the last three months are the most important uh, months for the further definition of the future being. So they are the most important in terms of hormones, in terms of interaction between mother and child, when the fetus is six, seven, eight, eight nine months. And um, so either the trauma or the lack, you know, the crisis between that body uh, that was the mother's body and the body of the child have had some kind of conflict or problem earlier, not conflict in terms of mental, I'm talking in terms of neurobiology and real traumatization, so that Shores says there must have been cellular death of areas of the amygdala which means the amygdala has restricted itself, could not grow enough. Is the amygdala the basis of empathy? Yes and no. I mean, you need to have a constellation to arrive at empathy, to arrive at being human, which means you need the areas, you need the parts of the organs, you need the parts of the right brain, especially functioning, but mostly you need the connections. So if one has become antisocial, meaning I kill other people like an, a psychopath. Uh, it's almost beyond the terrorism. It's, I, I don't even have an, an ideology. I just uh, have a need to destroy. Um, if you have arrived at that point, evidently you have for sure cellular death and lack of connection with other areas. To be empathic, it looks like we need connection in at least 10 areas of the brain. So we need to avoid thinking that one area is the bulk of everything. It's that area and the connections of other areas around. I want this to be clear. But having said this, antisocial people, antisocial personality disorder for Kernberg cannot be treated, meaning they would not engage in the process, relational process with the motivation and the desire to change that you need in order to have a therapy functioning. When all is said and done, unless the other person, the patient, really has some motivation to change and to engage in the therapeutic relationship, the therapist alone cannot do anything. I want to stress this because, you know, when we start this career, this job, we think I'm going to solve all the problems for everybody else a bit grandiose, of course, but with a good sense. I mean, you want to redeem uh, unhappiness in the other people. You want to help people grow. You want to do a lot of things for the other people. This is one of the intentions, of course, with, whom you, with which you enter this job. But, uh, you know, there are cases, you know, the, let's say, let's put it that way. The person needs to resonate with you and needs to arrive at a point, and it might come through steps, 
but it needs to arrive at a willingness to work with you. And uh, for, for Kernberg, he starts with um, a, a, um, how do you say, a contract. He starts with a contract because it's a first step of getting together what, I mean, do we agree on what is the problem, what you want to solve? If you can't even go past the contract phase, like, do we agree that the major problem for you is, uh, I don't know, doing this and not doing that? And do we agree on what are the basic elements of what we want to achieve in the therapy? If we don't even agree on that, there is no process in the therapy. So for Kernberg, and I, I think to a certain extent that is important to have, at least you need a basis from which you start from. We want to work on this. Do we agree that that is the problem? And for, you know, um, I, I, I know, I don't know if you have experience, uh, if you already as students have to see patients or not. In the Italian system, the students cannot see patients because they need to take you know, pass the exams. So I don't know if you can really see patients. This would help me if somebody would like to say, Olga, maybe if somebody would like to tell me uh, if you can see patients under supervision, even at this stage, or you have to finally get, you know, graduate and then get, uh, get a degree and then pass the board exam and then you see patients. Because I, I, in a sense, I would like to know what is your um, experience with this kind of problems with these patients. So that when I speak of contract, you have in mind how difficult it could be when you try to simply say, do we agree that this is the problem? And I, I will give you an example since I don't get an answer yet. Uh, the example is uh, my patient Dorothy. We, um, in terms of cases, it's a case. Um, it's in uh, chapter six of borderline bodies, and this woman, among the major symptoms, she had started self cutting. She was uh, depressed in her behavior, but one of the major symptoms was that she would uh, drink on Friday evenings uh, to get social, what she would say, I, know, I need to be social, I need to be open, I need to go out, I need to go to bars. So she would drink and then accept drugs from uh, foreigners, from strangers. And then uh, she might go to bed with these people. The problem is it's not um, mostly a moral ethical problem. Who are we to judge about the sexual life of people? The problem is that she, she would dissociate. She would dissociate because drinking has an, that effect if you are traumatized and you have a dissociative structure. Dorothy has dissociative structure with complex PTSD. She would drink and then uh, dissociate, meaning she was not in her body, she was not in her mind. She would not even remember sometimes what had happened that night or there were moments that he was not remembering so this this would have this would become dangerous sometimes the next day she might have like signs of bites or something that evidently the partner of that night had um, had expressed in a sense on her body and she would not remember those episodes and this was very scary this was very frightening this was uh, dangerous but she would say, and these are levels of denial, she would say, oh, you don't understand. I mean, meaning, what do you want to understand? You are not somebody who goes out on Friday night and, and know how the situation is. She would say, you know, um, what do I live for if I can't get social, if I can't have fun, if I don't go out at night? And if I go out at night and I don't drink, what, what is the purpose? And um, do you mind if I take, I never do this, but I might have to take a phone call. Can we have two moments just of a break since we have mid, mid, midway through? All right, okay. for sure. I'm sorry, but I was expecting a phone call. Oops. We can um, still be on a little uh, break if you need to for two minutes. Or uh, we can go on. Give me some signs of what you want to do. I can drink some water. I can certainly do that. 
Well, I mean, I wasn't taking a break to begin with, so yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so do you think we can? Well, if everybody is in place, I don't know where Vincenzo I don't went. See, I don't see uh, people opening up. The, the... Okay. At least Olga, I need Olga at least. <laughs> okay, Le I I uh, hello, good morning. Good morning to whoever. Actually, we... yeah, where is Olga? One sec. Sorry? Everything? Yeah, I was just, uh, I'm just going to confirm that Olga is still here. Okay. One sec. Okay. А вы здесь, все хорошо? Угу. Просто у нас перерывчик такой небольшой был. Да, да. Yeah, Olga's here. Everything's all right. Yeah, I know that Olga's here. I can see her. <laughs> well, but okay. you can you can actually hear her though. <laughs> uh, so shall I start again? Shall I, can I resume? Right. Yep, I think we're good to go. Well, I will start and then uh, maybe other people will join us. So basically, uh, this is, as I was saying, I tried to put together the three major moments that, according to Alan Shore, are fundamental deve developmentally in order to create... Uh, in order to describe when trauma uh, was experienced early on in the first two years of life uh, in connection to the psychopathologies that they, that they developed. As I was saying, the earliest, the most severe, so antisocial personality disorder, which is the most severe personality disorder you can have, and according to Kember, there is no cure for that, unfortunately, because people are not willing to repair anything. They have no sense of guilt. They have no desire to connect uh, emotionally and with honesty to the other person. So how can you treat them? They would not uh, adhere to the treatment. So antisocial would be uh, caused by early trauma. I was saying early on, even uh, pre, um, pre before birth in the last three months of pregnancy, or in the early months, like four months, in the first months. And that is the most severe, the most, uh, the earliest and most severe is always that the connection. Why? Because uh, evidently the features, the structures of the, uh, the brain and the personality and the person form in, in, in development is evidently most um, delicate. And so if you are, uh, you know, in those months, it uh, is, uh, yeah. so the earliest, the most severe. The second moment that uh, Alan Shore defined as fundamental to understand when trauma evidently was between mother and child was the moment between nine, 12 months, when he says that there might be, if there is a problem in the separation and connection and separation together with the child, there might be uh, the moment for the formation of, so etiopathogenically, the formation of borderline disorder per se. Being borderline, what we just described in the sense also of DSM, borderline per se, they self-cut, they are suicidal, they have compulsiveness in several areas, impulsivity, ups and downs, re, um, affect dysregulation, in, um, problems with relationship. They can't be in relationship because they feel invaded, but the moment they feel that the other person is rejecting them, they feel abandoned. So abandonment and emptiness is the major problem for them. According to Shore, evolutionary, developmentally, uh, the moment that was critical for their um, crisis and their trauma was between 9 and 12 months. What does it mean? In those moments, in those months, the mother or the caregiver needs also to let go of the child. It's the first separation between mother and child because the child is becoming more curious about the environment, maybe starts you know, exploring, but also you know, exploring also physically and starting finally walking, you know, around the 12 months, the child could walk. 
And so those moments are first moments of separation, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally from the caregiver. And if a mother is maybe herself a borderline, has a problem, it, if you have read Margaret Mahler in psychoanalysis, she speaks about the second phase of rapprochement, of riavvicinamento. <laughs> Rapprochement, the second phase, the second moment of getting together in which the mother has to let go of the child and then has to be reunited with the child. And if a mother does not, uh, does not feel comfortable with those moments of first separation with the child, the child also gets the sense that there is something wrong about uh, moving in, metaphorically her first steps or his first steps and, and um, the first transaction in which the mother has to start letting go of the child. If that, and so if there are emotions connected to that, and also if a mother is too anxious and cannot separate all the bulk of emotions that, so that the mother cannot regulate the emotions in the child, if the mother is borderline, there is no way she can, uh, um, affect regulate her own states and therefore she cannot regulate the states of the child besides a borderline mother can use alcohol and drug and drugs can be binging vomiting whatever she can do all kinds of things so those moments of disruption are going to interfere with the development of the child it is just the way it is i mean it's natural that way i mean it's uh, and it, it does not mean that there is an, a, a genetic biological problem. So the mother is a borderline, the child is borderline. It means that the mother cannot do for herself things that she would have to do for the child. So how can the child learn those separation processes, those emotional regulations, those levels of mentalization, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, and so, uh, nine, 12 months is the moment for uh, the possible development of a borderline personality disorder. With the features of borderline, I can't be by myself, but I can't be reunited. I am afraid of uh, rejection, but I'm afraid also of being invaded. I, I have uh, constant ups and downs. I can't regulate my emotions. And it is based on the problems on the amygdala regulation that we express so many times. The third thing that um, the third major disorder in terms of personality disorder that Alan Shore highlights, and I have to say, Alan Shore does not work mostly with borderline. He is interested in trauma, he's interested in pathology, but what I have taken from his work was because I was interested in personality disorder. So I wanted to put together his own trauma theory to the problems of borderline. So don't get confused that his work is not mostly on borderline. There are a few chapters here, here and there. And I tried to understand the, the traumatic functioning and the traumatic relationship, how they affect the mother and child development. So that relationship and child development. So this is really part of what uh, I, I have developed from him, but it is not his major, um, uh, achievement. It is not that he's a, a personality disorder uh, expert per se. I mean, he's an expert on trauma. He's an effect, uh, a, expert on affect regulation, on neurobiology, neuroscience, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on relational psychoanalysis, but not particularly on personality disorder. So don't don't get me misunderstood in a sense. So when he says that uh, the moment critical for uh, narcissism, for a develop, possible development of narcissistic personality disorder is uh, uh, 18 months, we need to think what it means. You need to imagine what a child is doing when he is 18 months. And one could say, why a narcissistic person has, um, you know, is in a developmental phase that is uh, further up, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a grown-up child. I mean, what is a child who is 18 months really doing? He's walking and he's starting speaking. So he's starting really separating, even symbolically, from the other people. And he's, 
is more independent, is really more a self in connection to the rest of the world. What am I saying? For borderline, there is more of this symbiotic separation moment. For the, the narcissistic person, and you know, there are two ways of understanding narcissism. One is Kernberg's way of thinking that there is innate aggressiveness for narcissists, and we don't believe that. The other is with Kohut, Hans Kohut. He thinks that there has been deficit. We think that with sure there has been deficit, meaning there has been trauma. So my view of uh, narcissism goes more along the lines of Kohut, not along the lines of Kernberg for this point. So what does Shor says about the narcissism? If a child is the critical moment is 18 months, why is that? Basically, he says that, that the, the, the image of the child is a bit more stable. But the point is that his self-esteem depends heavily on the other person, on the person taking care of him or her. And at that point, if the person, the child, uh, is humiliated or frustrated or, uh, you know, there are wounds in her uh, narcissism, in her development, then at that point, uh, the child might have to shut down in the connection between self and other, creating an inflated self so that he has to protect his self with a grandiose self or something that all revolves all around him so that the other is deleted. The other becomes a source of frustration, of not good mirroring, of not, um, how can I say, you know, the other does not reflect my best self, does not help my self-esteem. On the contrary, the other humiliates, frustrates, or represses me even physically in, in a way that is more um, disturbing almost. It's humiliating. According to Shaw, this is the moment in which uh, narcissism is created. I'm saying this because you might think if narcissism is more severe, why does it come evolutionary or developmentally in a further moment? The point is that you need to have already a, a self created. A child of 18 months is already in need of an image. Think of um, when Freud speaks about um, narcissism. He speaks of a first phase for all of us. If we have well developed, there is uh, something that we can say primary positive narcissism, meaning we have been mirrored, in quote, we have been received from the environment, the feeling of acceptance, the feeling of having our needs uh, mirrored, reflected and satisfied so that we grow a sense of self-esteem. The problem with the narcissism is mostly self-esteem. They look like they have a strong self-esteem. They have like, you know, built up, you know, they are even arrogant, they are aggressive, they are grandiose. The point is that you would not have arrogance and, and grandiosity unless you have, uh, unless you have uh, um, a, a frustration in that, uh, in that uh, level, unless you have a vulnerability there. So the problem of narcissist is really of narcissism is really about self-esteem. So that they are not capable, and this is another point for narcissism, they are not really capable of having a relationship with the other, but they need the other in order for the other to reflect themselves. So they need the others as audience, they need the others as you know friends that make them feel popular on Facebook, Instagram, the social platforms of any kind and portals and so they need some kind of mirroring that they have lacked internally so in, a, in effect what they have is lack of self-esteem is this grandiosity this pumping of the self uh, deleting the other is a sign that they need to in order to survive they need to just be a self without a connection with another. You know, when all is said and done, our health, our, our integrity, our strength as human beings 
comes from this the capacity to articulate the fact that we are a self in connection with the other. So we can find pleasure, we can find love, we can find you know um, a, a access our resources, implement them in a social environment. We can work, we can find satisfaction in life. In order to have that, which is being healthy or a little bit neurotic, depending on what we have, but mostly we can have advantage from, we can find pleasure from life. You know, in order to have that, you have a regulation of self and other. Freud would say ego, S and superego needs to be articulated in a, in a sort of uh, harmonious uh, way, balanced way. Now we speak mostly about self and other development. And for personality disorder, this is the, the bulk of the problem. A borderline needs to have another, but is afraid of getting rejected, of losing the other, or missing the other, loss, uh, emptiness, uh, rejection, abandonment. A narcissist needs to delete the other in order to feel strong, in order to... So there is a basic lack of empathy that they enforce and they express in their behavior because they need to consider only their own needs. And that is a major problem for reality, for, uh, for society, not only for reality and for themselves, but it's a problem for society. And we are growing masses of narcissists, as you know. Narcissists and beyond the narcissism, people who are verging on psychotic levels, like people in denial, they are personality disorders, but also linking towards, uh, towards psychotic. Which means since we, it's not that uh, humanity is losing <laughs> some kind of strength and vitality and health, it means the conditions of the upbringing or the traumatic conditions are stronger evident in our society. For, um, Shore would say we need two caregivers, two caregivers to, to be healthy. Borderline people in general don't have a good relationship with, with not even one caregiver. If you have a good caregiver, then there is some sort of attachment that works, some levels of organization of affects. You know, one caregiver is good enough. Ideally, you should have two caregivers. Even better, so Shore says there will be three caregivers for the real self-esteem. In our societies, if we grow up with one secure parent who loves us, that's a lot already. So we need to think how we are, uh, you know, what kind of society, societies we are creating, how we are growing, we are letting our children grow. Okay, I need to do a couple of things before we end. One is uh, in this book and uh, with the cases that I presented, I presented full developed uh, cases from of all the borderline spectrum. This is the other clarification I need to give you. I was saying borderline organization, according to Campbell, means that level of difficulties. Identity diffusion, primary defenses, reality testing retained. Within that uh, spectrum of difficulty, they are not neurotic, they are not psychotic also. You have mostly hysteric, hyster for Campbell, you have only those five types. And this is not also completely described here because these are actually the slides has to do with the, the cases that I have developed. Uh, paranoid and schizoid were not cases of mine. So I did not put them, but that is the continuum. According to Kernberg, we have hysteric histrionic, less severe, closer to neurotic end. You see in the upper left neurotic. Hysteric histrionic, better object relationship, better capacity to love and be in relationship. So hysteric histrionic. Then you have borderline proper in the sense of DSM. They self-cut, they are suicidal, loss, ta, 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 what we just said. And they can be of high functioning and low functioning. High functioning means less destructive. They can work maybe fine and they have problems in their um, 
emotional uh, relationship and their love relationship or the reverse. Usually it's love relationship that they are most, um, that are the weakest. Or borderline low level means they function uh, less and they have more disruptiveness and destructiveness in all areas of their life. This was the case of Dorothy with, that I told you about, the woman who would say to me, you don't understand if I don't drink, if I don't get all those things, how can I be social? And so even if I, I'm in danger of being killed one night in the beds of the strangers, uh, what's, what fun can I have if I don't do that? So that was a severe borderline case, low-level personality organization with dissociation, self-harming, alcohol abuse, promiscuity, and, distract and destructiveness. Then you have going on in terms of uh, more difficult uh, cases, more severe and more, uh, um, uh, how do you say, um, you know, more disruptive, you know, more severe people who might kill themselves, might be in worse conditions or ruin their lives, their money, their resources. Narcissism, and in the book, there is the case of Fabian, where I treat also suicidality, huge problem. A borderline might end up killing themselves by mistake. A narcissist plans suicidal, suicide and makes it a big thing, a, a, big, a big scene for the entire um, people. So narcissism, even in suicidal uh, uh, behavior, is different from borderline. The dynamics clarify if they are narcissist, more narcissist or more borderline. And then I put there on that continuum, psychoso severe psychosomatic disorders and sadomasochistic uh, uh, destructive sexual behaviors between self and other. Because I had cases in that sense and they show how uh, psychosomatic, when it means not, you know, hysteric means, as in Freud, that the function uh, is disrupted, but the organ is fine. I can, Adriadna, in the case of hysteric, uh, did lose menstruation when she had uh, a, a boyfriend. Then she would interrupt the, the relationship with the boyfriend, she had menstruation. So it means the body is working, it's the mind that is, is inter interfering. In psychosomatic, you have real damage. So it would be like an operation at ovaries. You need to get, you know, cancer. You need to get uh, operation because, uh, you know, like the case of Elizabeth, she had the resection of the stomach because of ulcer. Then she had, uh, you know, operation, intervention, surgery on the breast because of cancer, surgery on the ovaries because of cancer all kinds of interventions on the body because the body was damaged physically. So that is not hysteric histrionic, that is psychosomatic. And if you read, and I, I, can, I can tell you, I, I don't know if you read MacDougall, um, Joyce MacDougall, Theaters of the Body, she is among the few psychoanalysts who really uh, deals with she's dead at this point but she died in 2012 if you want to know just because I'm curious to see up to when these people were active and so what would they be contributing now with all the research that we have now it makes sense then to know when they stopped producing the research so in any case Joyce Mac McDougall um, is among the few psychoanalysts who really deals with uh, together with some French analysts, I should not say that, uh, um, uh, who really have an understanding of <coughs> psychosomatic disorder, severe psychosomatic disorder with real illness in the body as a developmental process in which uh, so the, the structure is closest to the psychotic impairment. So structurally, you know, for us, it's not the symptoms. While all, uh, you know, all the people in the world, uh, including cognitivists or other people, <coughs> excuse me, would uh, 
point at symptoms to try to solve the problem. We don't point at symptoms. We don't go to the symptom. We go to the structure. If the structure is neurotic, certain kind of treatment could even be on the couch. If the person is borderline, you see the person in front and you have another way of processing. I'm just starting the work with you today in this way, telling you that there is a, the treatment that um, Kernberg is, uh, has devised and Fonagy, and this is my own contribution to that. <clears throat> and it's an integration of not only psychoanalysis but and psychodynamics, but also neuroscience and attachment, which, you know, if you have psychoanalysis, you don't have attachment neuroscience. If you have attachment neuroscience, you don't have psychoanalysis. Why is that? So what I was trying to do is put really integrating psychodynamic processes and the psychoanalytic understandings of levels of functioning with the knowledge that we have now, which is neuroscience, which is attachment, because they explain not only behaviors, but structures. And developmentally, they explain how you get a borderline mind, how you get a narcissist uh, personality, how you get a psychosomatic severe patient. You know, most of the people we see nowadays <clears throat> come with serious problem that no doctor, physical doctor can solve. And sometimes they are hypochondriacs, so they don't have real pathology, but in other times they do have real pathologies. But there is no, what I'm trying to say in psychosomatic, you have a damage of the organ, a damage of the body, but there is not the possibility for the mind of the person to access the pain, the emotions, and the process that brought to that bodily damage. What I'm saying is that, and that is also why I, I call for a return to the body, meaning I call the book Borderline Bodies, not for a, because it's a, you know, a title that I like, but because I see in psychoanalysis this part missing, so it's not only the body in terms of neurobiology, but it's the body and not only in terms of symptoms, but also in the relationship, the developmental relationships that we come to be certain things with some features and some dynamics and some functionings or personality disorder with some symptoms because of the self and other process that we have internalized. And I remind you, and this is um, one of the other things I wanted to put together with the previous lectures. I remind you that uh, for me, <clears throat> uh, in order to explain why these people self-cut, why these people are so destructive, disruptive and destructive with their bodies, they hurt and damage physically their body, I could not come up for a reason for that. For Kern, there would be innate aggressiveness. They are born that way. I don't think we are born with certain features. And this is against Freud. Freud would say that the drives are mostly innate. But he lived, you know, decades ago. Now we know certain things differently. Shaw would say even the temperament is not innate, is epigenetic. So if everything, if our development is part of what we become, because of the life circumstances, we need to, to think and try to explain why, for example, adolescents nowadays self-cut and are suicidal to an extreme, why other people binge eating or become you know, obsessed with their body image in a narcissistic, in a, narcissistic, in a, in a, in a in an anorexic way, whatever, why are they so destructive and why very often they attack the body in their destructiveness. We don't need only to understand the symptoms. If in any treatment for eating disorders, they start from the symptom. The symptom, as you know from psychoanalysis, is the point one Freud. The symptom is, he would say, um, formation di comprom for, um, um, compromise formation for a lot of things. Let's say it's the in-between, between body and mind expression, resolution, in quote, even if it is a damaging of the body or damaging of life, it's the resolution of 
the conflict or the problem that the mind and the person has found because of pre-existing problem. So we need to find what was the problem to start with. We are not uh, uh, satisfied with giving skills and drills uh, to people who vomit. Or We need to understand the dynamic and especially the origin of that. For me and for sure for other people, the dynamic for borderline disorder is mostly traumatic. Traumatic in the sense that we said, not because of the earthquake, not because of uh, something, natural catastrophe, but damage in long-term relationship. And um, I just remind you of uh, those three levels of uh, interpersonal traumatization, trauma of human agency that I devised for clarification. The first one is a mother who cannot cope with the child. Early relational trauma, that is sure. The second level, maltreatment abuse with identification with the aggressor is something that I see in action in these people. Why should they destroy their body, self-cut and do all kinds of things? Of course, it's also affect regulation or dysregulation being regulated through those uh, attacks on the body. Why would you have to do that? if they have not only affect dysregulation, but also the desire to attack their body as if their body were alien and as if the body were something like an intermediary in between kind of thing between self and other. And there has been violence or a complex PTSD, complex trauma between self and other. For me, and I take this also from Fonagy, who, of course, would know nothing about borderline disorders because at this time, nobody would see, they don't uh, treat it. They, they would not treat borderline disorders. There, were, there was not even the label for that. But, and we might wonder why end of uh, 19th century hysterical women, nowadays mostly, you know, uh, borderline disorders and eating disorder, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, on the second level, this peep, and I see the dynamic of the identification with the aggressor, which I repeat means the self-disgust and the self uh, the sense of uh, guilt, shame that uh, these people have internalized by an abusive relationship, a long-term very often primary relationship, the sense of violence and self-disgust has been directed onto the body. Otherwise, I don't know why they should do that. So in therapy, if you get to the root of that, of why they have internalized the sense of guilt, shame, disgust of themselves, where does that come from? From what kind of relationship from what kind of traumata, even early traumata, abandonment, abuse, neglect, uh, or uh, in, in position, if you say that, of uh, all kind of uh, aggressive, uh, bizarre things sometimes in education. If you get to the, uh, to the unfolding of that traumatic reasons, then the dynamics change. And I see treatment as the way in which uh, those traumata are become accessible in the relationship with you. Because as time goes on, and I particularly recommend two uh, sessions a week, if you can't work two sessions a week with these people, at least once a week. But that is like a drop in an ocean because these people in, in one in one week, in one sentence a week, uh, you know, they do so many negative, disruptive, uh, terrible things that you, you don't have time to analyze, to comment, to feel, to, to describe, to understand. And then you go to the next week. So you, you don't have the possibility of really uh, getting close to the, the problem there. What is the real dynamic? How are they feeling? And what are they doing as a result of what they are feeling. So to have in mind this dynamic of this identification with the aggressor, I think is important. 
And uh, just to clarify again, the third level, massive traumatizations, has nothing to do, in a sense, with borderline disorders. I'm not saying that if you go, if you end up being, and I'm sorry to give you this example, if you ended, if you had ended up in the Holocaust, you are developing a personality disorder. I'm not saying that. You are extremely traumatized. You have uh, symptoms. You have a lot of things. But the people who get uh, traumatized and might get uh, uh, personality disorder are the second and third generations. So they are the children, the grandchildren. What I'm saying is that if we nowadays are not careful with the masses of um, immigrants, refugees, uh, people coming from war, or the masses on whom we are imposing violence, not only those, deep, those people are traumatized, but the chain is intergenerational, so that you will have antisocial personality disorder, borderline disorder, and uh, narcissistic disorder. So what are we doing socially? That is my question. And that is something that I think we should think of. I have the last 15 minutes to give you a sense, but to get the sense of the diagnosis that I propose, having described to you why I think that borderline people and narcissistic people do come from intergenerational trauma in the sense of not appropriate um, relationships, you know, trauma, interpersonal, intergenerational trauma, and uh, what we should do with them. Um, and this is a map that I have devised afterwards. It's not that I had this map in mind when I was seeing the cases. I've seen the cases. I've resolved most of the case, most of the problems of the cases. Then maybe some people could have done something more, could have, but mostly, you know, they solved the symptoms, they worked on the structure, they, they solved the part of the problems in the structure. They have a much uh, more functioning, health, healthier life or happier life. That is the sign uh, that you can um, say at the end. So having considered afterwards what I think I've done, I think, and having told you what are the theories that are fundamental for me. Sure, Kerber for clinical staff, not for for not only for diagnosis. Uh, not for, no, for, for diagnosis up to a certain point, but not for hepatogenesis. Sure, for hepatogenesis. Kerber for clinical staff, dynamics, defenses, but with the revision of theory that includes Ferenzi, for me, the trauma theory that is opposed to Freud's trauma theory, and also Andre Green, whom we have not had the time to speak, maybe I've mentioned, but you know, when we have people who come to us with all kinds of symptoms, severe symptoms, distract, destructive, destructiveness in the body, self-attack, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they are not uh, neurotic, but they are within the borderline spectrum. Very often, you have uh, violence, abuse. Gabbard says sixty percent of these women have been uh, in some sexual abusive relationship or even incest, but. Um, um, what was I saying? Um, I'm sorry. Um, so I was saying these people come when not only they come for the, so they have internalized this. Uh, well, when they come for all these disturbances in the body and this destructive, destructive dynamics, I had to come to terms with what kind of lives they had. And I had mentioned Andre Green for this reason. Very often, on top of the abusive relationship they might have had, maybe with fathers or other people, they very often have a mother who was like in the still face, a mother who was a, um, a depressed mother, an absent mother in the, in the sense, not only physically, sometimes they are even missing physically, but we are speaking of a mother who is absent psychically, 
who is a mother who cannot look at the child, cannot uh, take care of the child, is too depressed or just uh, not present emotionally for the child. So severe emotional neglect. So I put together these things as a result of what I have seen in the patients and as a result of what I think has worked for them. If we understand where the process and the dynamics come from, and I see this is a grid that I have devised in borderline bodies. And it's like three major axes. <laughs> I see the eyes of somebody. Be aware of your eyes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I have to speak with the people I see. Uh, three axes, vertical axes, are um, the, most, the, mo the major parts of the assessment. The other two are a secondary reflection I propose, but it's a grid in the sense that you have three major axes that are fundamental for its pathogenesis, for the symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. And then two minor things that I want to add to that, but the major axes are the vertical axes. What do I evaluate? Levels of relational traumatization, attachment styles. If you can do the attachment interview, good. If you can't, you have a sense if the person comes from a, a, a disruptive relationship with the parents, with the parents missing, parents who are dead, the parents who are in jail, parents who did all kinds of aggressive, negative, neglectful things. So attachment styles. If they are, if they have that severity of symptoms, it is impossible that they have security of attachment. They would not be in your room with you, in that room with you. They would be healthy or a little bit neurotic. Security of attachment is what we as therapists should have, not the patient. The patient don't come with security of attachment. So in any case, I evaluate attachment styles. Obviously, if they are really borderline, they have insecurity of attachment or most often disorganized attachment, traumatic relationship early on, first two years of life, with very often, if you have disorganization of attachment, maltreatment, abuse, severe deprivation. Look, try to understand how well the first years of life, sometimes they don't remember traumatic sign, memory block, Sometimes they come up with idealization, ask, be with them, checking, you know, when uh, would you be picked up from school regularly? They would say, oh, I had the perfect parent. Would your father and mother come to pick you up? Oh, they were always late. Or sometimes I would have to spend the time with the, 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 the keeper there because they would not come. So check with them what they mean, but what they think they remember. So not only they might be dissociated, but they might even have idealization. In uh, adult attachment interview, most of the people who have dismissing attachment, who are also narcissists, have high idealization of their childhood. Or they would say perfect relationship. They would say either per perfect relationship so idealization of the parents, or they would say, oh, I don't care. I grew up as a very tough, strong boy and I could manage by myself. I don't care to speak about my childhood. Those are all levels of dismissing and, uh, you know, even um, disregarding and devaluating the childhood because they can't go there. All things that they need to attack at some point, that you need to be with them in the moment in which they are going to see the reality of their childhood. So maltreatment, abuse, and severe deprivation, levels of dissociation and intergenerational transmission. Where the parents coming from war, where the parents coming from uh, extermination of some kind, from torture, political torture, from severe problems, intergenerational transmission means if the mother had a major trauma, how could she provide the care, the tenderness that the child needs in order to develop as, a, as a, a happy human being, I want to say. So that is the first um, axis. The second axis, we need to know what kind of personality disorder is. It's more hysteric, histrionic, more borderline, more narcissist, 
or there are other kinds of antisocial personality disorder, we need to know. And if we can't analyze that, there is not only DSM to know the features from outside, so to speak. There are dynamic, psychodynamic, excellent books describing this. More than my book, I would say, I would start with uh, Nancy McWilliams about uh, psychodynamic diagnosis. Then I would put together other things there because uh, Nancy McWilliams describes the kind of color and feelings that uh, hysteric personality, borderline not really, narcissist, paranoid, schizoid, etc., etc., very good work. Sometimes she cannot distinguish, she does not give you the sense, at least when you are at the beginning of, you know, so you are a student there, you, it is not clear that kind of description if it belongs to, for example, hysteric neurotic or hysteric borderline. That is something that only through experience you understand a bit more. So that could be improved. Then body disturbances, what do they come from? Probably they come from symptoms more than anything. I have, uh, you know, they come with a lot of uh, documents that they can't find a physical illness, but they think they are going to die of this and that. Hypochondria, very severe, means they are severe narcissists who have relationship only with parts of their bodies. They don't have self-other relationship. They are all um, revolved around their own sickness and the, in a sense, the death part of their bodies. Like, uh, and this is, I take this from Kernberg, this is very appropriate. He says, this is hypochondriac is very severe narcissism. The only libido in a sense, the only strength, interest, uh, passion they have in themselves is all cathected, is all taken by the, fear and the anxiety about their illnesses and, and the parts that they have, um, you know, the, where they have the damage. And, which means to me that they have a persecutory, internalized persecutory image inside or a dead, um, dead object for perversion, which has nothing to do with hypochondria. But I see that as a developmental further end. end when, uh, you know, perversion is only used for uh, sexual problems. We now say paraphiliac. I don't like to be so covering up certain things. And I start from the term that was given by psychoanalysis. To me, perversion means if self and other is our way of being alive and in relationship, perversion means that you cannot be in relationship with a full-fledged other and you relate only to certain parts of the body of the other or certain at certain conditions. And there is like a, a dead ritual in a sense of how things should be experienced in order for sexuality to reach, you know, to be, I don't even want to call it sexuality, in order to access excitation, orgasm, and physical um, expression of uh, of sexuality, but sexuality means, and in this I'm Freudian again, that you have an encounter with the other, what Freud would call genital sexuality, which is not a given nowadays. I wonder how many people have genital sexuality, but that is another problem. Um, then just to conclude, these are the major things I try to access as soon as I can, and then I revise them as we go on in the treatment. And the last two things is the capacity to dream. The more alexithymic, the more severe um, the illness is, the less metaphoric uh, uh, the dreams are. So there is not really much to analyze. Sometimes there are just nightmares or what the, uh, Andre Green would call evacuatory dreams. And then sexual and gender identity. This is a final point I developed and we could stay here forever. But it, it is just to say, if identity diffusion characterizes these people, how can, how can these people be sure who they are, what they are in the encounter with another and how the encounter with the other works and which body is this other? 
I think if you have this kind of identity diffusion, you cannot but have sexual identity diffusion, which means I don't really know who I am. A borderline woman like Dorothy would need to have something or either a comfort from the tenderness of the other body, better situation, or throwing herself in a situation in which she would be persecuted basically by another as she was persecuted by an incestuous father. I stop here just to say that the way I, I, I see the treatment, and we did not go to the treatment, in fact, or the cases, is what I, I call embodied witnessing. I take witnessing from Dori Laub, from all the people on trauma in psychoanalysis, testimony, witnessing, even if we read carefully Ferenzi, once he uses the, 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 the phrase of uh, a, a, an empathic and oh, what is it? benevolent and, um, and helpful observer, and then the true witness, he says, the analyst as the true witness. I put all those traumatic stuff, Ferenzi, and nowadays uh, contemporary trauma theory in psychoanalysis, Dory Laub, etc., um, to mm, you know to combine that with what we know from the body. The process needs to be in front, needs to be bottom up because our way of functioning and accessing emotions is bottom up. Finally, you give interpretation. Finally, you can reach the higher order faculties, but you need to rebuild this entire process. There is a right brain in this process. Yes, this is uh, sure. But there is this uh, relational, intersubjective reworking through of issues that can be accessed in therapy. And this is really a dual unconscious working through the body, the implicit memory of the two people. Enactment is the, this communication of two people in unconscious repetition. A lot of things you could say that. I mean, I devise all this idea of embodied witnessing where I put together what probably we have done, but always, but we now understand the process and we need to clarify to people who cannot use a psychodynamic understanding and uh, implicit memory, unconscious views, et cetera, et cetera. We need to explain to the world how we work. And we now have even neuroscience attachment and other dynamics that we can use profitably to express and explain what we do. Okay, I think, um, well, I, I would like... Um, I would like to, um, to stop here. I, I, I wish I, we had the time for questions. Of course, you could have interrupted me any time. But... Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Grazie ancora, Thank you if, you, if you want so much. one question, I can take it. <laughs> but if you would need to but go... But I think it's... It. Yeah, it's... Okay. It, it couldn't be de democratic to just to give a one question and somebody yeah, I, had left. Yeah. But... Uh, I, I think that uh, this, this is a, a beginning of cooperation with the University of uh, Bergamo. I think it's just a kickoff, as it's called to use. And uh, I really hope uh, to have the possibility to, to see you in Moscow in the, in the future. I would love and to. <laughs> and to have uh, a consistent, let me say, uh, program with you, with your colleagues from University of Bergamo, and uh, we will be very, very happy to. Uh, so, uh, as, uh, as I said, this was uh, the first uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, experiment no, that we have with, uh, with you with, uh, in the future. In a few weeks, Professor Scarati will, uh, uh, will be on, uh, hearing on air. So our, uh, our colleague that put us in, uh, uh, in touch and is coordinating from University of Bergamo. So okay. I think that these three three seminars were uh, very useful for uh, my colleagues, for, uh, uh, for the students. And uh, I really hope that in the near future, we will uh, keep for something more consistent and uh, useful for both, uh, both of us. Thank so you. I'm, I'm very grateful Thank you. that you share uh, uh, your, uh, your knowledge, your skills, uh, your uh, scientific uh, uh, 
discoveries uh, and I got very uh, <laughs> exciting and very good uh, feedback from the first uh, I'm happy. second and I think yeah. I will get also wonderful feedback for, for this uh, yeah. uh, seminar. And uh, so I'm very, I'm very sure that uh, despite uh, some of the issue that you had uh, today with the uh, uh, with the vaccine and, uh, and so on, so you, you enjoy you enjoy as well. Sure. And uh, so, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, the entire. Thank universe. you very much. For thank you. And I hope it was always very interesting. Thank you. We will keep in touch. Thanks a lot. Thank you.